let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war. But there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this. But every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? The weird thing about Republicans, particularly conservatives, is we have real heroes who believed in liberty and fought for it, and who fought the so-called establishment. And one of the greatest of the greats was Ronald Reagan. And I find the more that I mention Reagan, his foreign policy, his domestic policy, the more he and I come under attack. And I think it's because we have not exclusively, but too many younger Republicans who are relying on government, government intervention. Uh, they're becoming, they call themselves populists and populists uh, actually ran a candidate in 1876, and he was a socialist. Because when you apply populism to things, you're applying majority rule. But our government isn't about populism. It's about republicanism, little r republicanism. We're a republic. We're specifically not a parliament, and we're not majoritarian. Look at the Bill of Rights. Read the Bill of Rights. There's not a word there about populism or majoritarianism. Those are your individual rights given to you by God, and they can't be taken away by anybody else, certainly not morally or legitimately. But in other societies, people can vote and take these rights away, or the people are manipulated in a certain way to vote and take these rights away, or the people vote once and they install regimes where they never vote again. And so you have these totalitarian regimes and again, you don't have your rights. So this is very, very important to understand as we have this developing and new populism nationalism. And populism nationalism is even oxymoronic. What does that mean? What if a majority of the people vote for globalism? Well, now what are you going to do? Oh, that's perplexing. That's confounding. We've been here before. This isn't complicated. This is stupid. Uh, conservatism, I started a movement many decades ago called constitutional conservatism, is what protects us, the framers, um, the great philosophers, Locke and Montesquieu and Burke and Hume and on and on and on, the men that the founders of our country had studied and believed in, the Judeo-Christian ethic, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic, whether you like it or not, you live in a society that was founded on the Judeo-Christian ethic, which creates these rights and principles and understanding of society and so forth. And so when you start talking about populism, I always say to myself, when will they define this? And when will they try and find a way to uh, mesh that, whatever they're going to define, with the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence rejects populism. Talks about unalienable rights. That's not populism. Talks about natural law, natural rights. That's not populism. That's God Almighty. Talks about eternal truths. Talks about the divine. It has nothing to do with populism. Look at the Constitution. There's only one body in the original Constitution that's directly elected, and that's the House. And they have to share power with the Senate. The Senate was originally chosen by state legislatures. How about the courts? Are they elected? No. And thank God they're not. That doesn't mean there can't be reforms of the sort that I propose in the Liberty Amendments that I think are very important or the kind they're proposing in Israel. Um, what about the president and the vice president? They're people who believe left-wing populists, so we had to get rid of the Electoral College. Why? So the eastern seaboard or the western seaboard control the entire country. 
so the metropolitan areas control the entire country. So when you campaign, you can skip over middle America. You can skip over rural America. You can skip over uh, small towns and villages and the suburbs. Just go for the cities. Well, the framers understood that. And that's why we have an electoral college. So all corners of the country have a say in or participate in the governing system, even those that feed us, provide us with the fuel that we need, and all the rest. They're not the most populous areas, they're the least populous areas. And so this idea is, is kind of problematic. And throwing Reagan off the roof, along with Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and John Paul II, this lineup of tremendous, great statesmen who gave us the freest world in the history of mankind as they collaborated to defeat the Soviet Union. And they succeeded. And hundreds of billions of people were freed from these captive nations that the Soviet Union controlled, 15 of them, and the Eastern Bloc nations. Um, to just throw him overboard is really unbelievable to me. And quite frankly, it's, it's an ideology of sorts that is not that different from Marxism. The world begins today. Why? Because I'm 28 years old and I know everything. The world begins today. Why? Well, because they were imperfect in the past and we're more perfect today. We know more. What are you talking about? You don't know anything. Well, it doesn't matter. And so um, we have that problem right now uh, with people who believe they're William F. Buckley or William Rusher or Thomas Sowell or Milton Friedman, and yet reject what they taught us. They try to come up with new theories and new ideas. Well, I'm not moving. I am who I am, as Popeye once said. And I don't mean maybe. Um, about seven years ago to the day, our folks here uh, prepared an opening for a convention we had when we started a conservative review. And it was quite a nice convention. And I wanted to play it for you. It's just a couple of minutes. It's not about me. It's about Reagan and the rendezvous with destiny. And again, I'm extremely troubled that Reagan is so passe now or to be rejected completely because he just didn't get it, you know. We get it today. And by the way, an electoral juggernaut, massive landslide victories twice. And he had to fight the Republican establishment to even get nominated. Let's take a look from seven years ago. Go. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war. But there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this. But every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? Well, Nikita Khrushchev has told his people he knows what our answer will be. He has told them that we're retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary, because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side, he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? 
But it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. It's too bad we don't have a leader like Reagan right now. Really, it's too bad. And now you can see why Ronald Reagan is considered one of the greatest presidents in American history. Want to see more Mark Levin? Go to levintv.com and subscribe now.